for those participants who are new to peace vigil we are a peace education organization which brings information and knowledge on issues of justice and how people have fought for it so that there is more peace in the world we also provide trainings in peace intervention run study groups and use storytelling drama and song for our purposes we look at history and the contemporary world we look at many countries and cultures our motto is peace needs all of us which means that we believe that peace cannot be left to governments and international institutions like the united nations alone we the so called common people must participate in protecting and promoting it the first step towards it is equipping ourselves with knowledge knowledge about what are the threats to peace or in other words a study of injustice how people are fighting against it what people have done in the past and what we can do to change things it is a hopeful place as part of this effort we are delighted to bring to you today's discussion colonial legacies understanding modern inequalities it is my immense pleasure to welcome our speakers for today three activists and researchers who have spent decades working on the issue of inequality there is no way i can summarize all the important things these experts have done in an online forum with obvious time constraints i will therefore introduce them very briefly you can also see their introductions on the screen if you are watching i will now read them out for people who cannot see the screen bineshi albert is a campaigner for environmental justice and native rights she works on movement building and feminist organizing at the indigenous environmental network united states of america an activist scholar rasigan maharaj works on political economy innovation systems and public policies he is the founding chief director of the institute for economic research on innovation swane university of technology south africa samir dosani has been a campaigner for economic justice gender justice and peace he led the 50 years is enough united states network for global economic justice and the ngo forum on asian development bank adb uh, he is co founder of peace vigil and now i hand over to sami dosani my colleague who is also our moderator today thank you shreen um <clears throat> so thanks everyone for joining um so what is colonialism uh this is one image that was done by a satirist uh in England in the 16th century 17th century with <clears throat> the french and the english sort of carving up the world um this is one view of colonialism but i i think it's it's not an inaccurate one and let me begin by addressing some of the criticisms of the kind of um analysis that i'm about to provide and that that others that vinishi and rasigan will also provide there's a myth around the inevitability of this history um this is perhaps best articulated by an anthropologist called Jared Diamond um who puts forward in his uh, guns germs and steel and he puts forward a theory that basically i'm simplifying a lot but you know someone was going to dominate and europe dominated because it had the technical technological advantage now the technical uh, tech, technological advantage we'll get into in some detail in a minute um but let me just address the first part of that it is not true <laughs> that when two cultures come into contact one inevitably dominates the other um so it's true you know what happened happened um but it's also true that we are taught a certain version of history um in order to perpetuate a certain version of the present and we're going to examine um we're going to examine that uh articulation of history that articulation of the inevitability of this colonial reality um and we're going to i think uh, we're going to sort of poke holes in that through the course of the next 2 uh, hours 
um, on the premise that we will build a better future, a more just future, a more equitable future um, by dismantling and transforming uh, the institutions that we inherit. Um, so, like I said, we have to articulate that dominant narrative, which we will do at various times over the next uh, two hours. And then we have to be willing to challenge it because that narrative is what leads to prejudice. That narrative is what leads to continued judgment of certain communities. Um, that narrative implies domination. Um, and at Peace Vigil, that is a narrative that we're always looking to challenge. Um, let me begin uh, by going to the, um, the Neolithic Revolution. Um, so who I, I, you know, please, in your chat function, please change it so that you can, you're speaking with everyone. So you'll see that it's, by default, you're, it's all panelists. If you can change it to all panelists and participants. Um, um, so um, if you could please do that, then you can share your thoughts with everyone. So I'll ask, has anyone heard of the Neolithic Revolution? Does anyone know um, what, what that term means? Rasigan, you're not allowed to respond. Anyone? Just waiting a second for, yes, agriculture, good. Right. And, and just out of curiosity, settlement, not bad. Um, just out of curiosity, can anyone name a location where, so yes, agriculture, let's use agriculture as, and settlement um, as, as what we're talking about. What do you think, where do you think that first happened you know, on, on the planet Earth? <laughs> I mean, not, uh, not other than planet Earth, obviously it happened on planet Earth, it didn't happen on Mars, um, but where on planet Earth did it happen? Would anyone like to hazard a guess? In a tropical climate? Um, that is actually correct, but that is not what we are taught. What are we taught? If anyone remembers what they, what they learned in history books, my daughter just did this in grade, grade six, Fertile Crescent, exactly. Where is the Fertile Crescent? Can you name a country that's a uh, modern country that's part of the Fertile Crescent today? Hmm. Palestine, absolutely. Um, so this is what we're taught. I mean, we're taught that it happened about 12,000 years ago. Um, and just to flag that that's 12,000 years ago seems like a long time. Egypt is part of it for sure. Um, actually, Egypt is not really part of it. Sorry, it's, it's, it's more, um, you know, what, what we learned in the history books, it's called Mesopotamia. Uh, multiple sites, uh, Professor Rosigan says, with only a few having been surfaced to, to date, 100% correct. Um, but what we learn in the history books is that it's, um, sort of the area that, that the United States likes, likes to bomb, right? I mean, Iraq, um, Iran, um, that area in general. Um, uh, so just to say that we're taught that it happened 12,000 years ago, but humans have been around for at least 20 times that long, 240,000 years. Um, so the question about when, we're, when we are judging cultures or when we are looking at cultures, um, it's important to ask the question of what pre-Neolithic cultures looked like. Um, we also learned, I mean, those of us who, who even learned this at all in school, um, we learned that it happened in the Fertile Crescent, as you say, um, but it's not true. We now know, for example, that Solomon Island, uh, in the Solomon Islands in the Pacific, which is a very tropical location, um, taro, which is a kind of a, a, a tuber, a potato, has been cultivated since at least 28,000 years ago. That's long before, um, before anything happened in, um, in the Fertile Crescent. Australian cultivation, early Australian cultivation is being studied right now. That might also be older than 20,000 years. I, I don't wanna be quoted on that one, but that's the current, um, there's investigations ongoing that are examining that uh, possibility. Um, the Amazon forest itself, uh, recent studies have come up showing that um, the Amazon forest itself is, um, is in some ways a big garden, in some ways it's a big farm. Um, so it's certainly evidence of cultivation and that may go back. I haven't seen any good studies that date that cultivation, but it's certainly longer than 10,000 years ago. Um, well, I can't say certainly, but um, I believe it might be longer than 10,000 years ago. 
So I just want to point this out that the history we learn around the Fertile Crescent, it is to reinforce a narrative. And what is that narrative? It's, it's almost a linear progression. Like, has anyone seen that, that um, you know, the graphic of like monkeys becoming human, which is a very, very inaccurate and unsophisticated view of evolution, right? So you have an ape and then slowly becoming human and then, you know, someone puts Donald Trump at the end as a backward step or something like that. But jokes aside, um, the, the, the linear progression is you start in the Levant in the, fer in the Fertile Crescent, then you go to Egypt, then you go to Greece, right? Then you go to Rome, then you skip a, a thousand years or so. And suddenly it's about us, us in quotes. So it's a, a Eurocentric colonial civilization uh, that conquered the world. And I'd say that those of us who were conquered, by the way, we learn the same history. We don't necessarily learn, there are some exceptions. If you grew up in China, you might learn about the various dynasties of China. If you grew up in India, you'd learn about those dynasties. But by and large, those of us who live in territories that have been conquered by Europeans, learn the European uh, version of this history. So let me just go to the next one. Um, <clears throat> so now to address the, um, some of the implicit and explicit arguments in, uh, in Jared Diamond's you know, book, which posits sort of European superiority based on technologies. So I just wanna point out, can anyone guess, before we get to the, the, the gunpowder, can anyone guess um, what the, um, you know, this giraffe, this painting of the giraffe on the right, sorry, for those who are visually impaired, I'm showing a slide here. On the right is a man um, with a giraffe and the man looks distinctly not African. Giraffes, as we know, are only found in Africa. And on the left um, is a, some kind of a soldier who looks like he's from East Asia with fireworks. Uh, Sami, sorry to interrupt. We just want to make sure that Vineshi, um, you know, she is on, she can hear, but is she, I, I, oh yes, sorry, sorry. I was yes, looking for yes. Vinishi. Okay. okay, I will, I will just yeah. promote her to panelist. Thank you, fantastic. Okay, great. So we have all our, our panelists. Thank you so much. Um, so who would like to hazard a guess? From when is this, this uh, painting on the right with the giraffe, it's depicting a specific historic event. Would anyone like to hazard a guess? First, I'll, I'll not ask the specific event. It's too, it's too um, esoteric. No one will guess the event, but let's just guess the date. What date do you think that this uh, giraffe arrived in Asia? No guess? Based on the, the style of the painting, does anyone want to guess a date? Three three thousand BC, not quite uh, not quite that uh, that old. No, any other guess? Two hundred AD. No, not quite that old either. Um, fourteen fourteen. Rasigan's cheating. Rasigan, Rasigan, you're the one who sent me this article. Um, yes, fourteen fourteen. It is, um, and this was a gift uh, by an Indian ruler. So someone who was sort of a uh, not a not someone from the Mughal Empire. Someone who was uh, lower than that. I believe he was ruling Bengal. He gifted this to China, this giraffe, um, which meant that there was trade between East Africa and Bengal at the time, right? So navigation existed, poetry, art, philosophy, mathematics, um, and advanced warfare existed. In fact, two of the three things, so leaving the germs aside, germs are just a factor of, you know, if you, if you go to a new place, as we know in the current pandemic situation, um, germs can spread all over the world very easily. So leave germs aside, let's talk about the guns and the steel. Um, neither the guns nor the steel had much to do with Europe, right? The steel was invented by the stronger swords, which allowed for a better kind of warfare or for more powerful swords, were invented by Arabs. Um, in fact, that method of tempering steel is called Damascus steel. Um, and they had been manufacturing that from uh, materials from South India, starting in the ni ninth century of the Common Era. Um, Gunpowder was also invented in the ninth century of the Common Era by, um, by, Chinese, by people in China. Um, they used a kind of cannon as early as like the 11th or 12th century. Um, and later on in about the 14th, 1400s, early 1400s, Arabs or some Arabs, it might have been Persians, 
who invented the first, um, the first guns. So it certainly wasn't Europeans, uh, just to sort of put that out there. Um, so, but that said, it is worth spending some time thinking about what European society looked like at the beginning of the colonial era. Um, and I think that, um, you know, I mean, just to say that I don't particularly like the term sort of backwards or advanced or so on. I don't think that that's a good judge of any society. Um, but by the same measure, those are the terms that are used to judge our societies or non-European societies. So I think it's important to note that compared to um, the Safavids in Iran, compared to Ming China, compared to Mughal India, and probably compared to Mayans, Incas, and other cultures in the Americas, uh, I can't say that with certainty because a lot of the evidence has been destroyed, um, European society had not yet progressed to the level of those other societies. Um, it was a very hierarchical, um, a kind of a mix of Confucian, um, uh, primitive Confucian, I would say. Uh, Ch China itself had gone far beyond this interpretation of Confucianism, um, but a kind of a king worship as well as an Indian, uh, again, a primitive version of an Indian caste system. Um, so that was sort of what was happening um, in Europe. Um, and uh, I mean, this is ideal. When we look at this pyramid, we should remember that this that didn't really exist in the way that it's portrayed in the history books. Um, if we look at the list, for example, of kings in France after Charlemagne, I mean, it's a long list. It's a laundry list. Um, people were competing. People at the top of this pyramid were competing with one another to uh, survive. Uh, they were constantly fighting wars. Uh, and it meant that they had a constant need of money. And so they dreamt of big stockpiles of money. But they knew such, stock, such stockpiles did not exist in Europe. Um, so they explored. They went, to, um, they went to Africa. They went to the Bakongo Kingdom in what is today Angola in 1491, and then on to the Americas. Um, and let me just say one more thing about why we don't know much about some of those cultures in the Americas. I'm sure Bineshi will share some more as well. Um, but I just wanted to introduce the term um, epistemicide. Uh, this is a term that has been popularized by um, an activist called, uh, and, a, and a scholar um, called de Souza Santos. He, um, you know, epistemology is basically a knowledge system, right? So when you study, say you study a religion, you can talk about a Buddhist epistemology. Um, but he introduces the term epistemicide, meaning that uh, what the Europeans did, especially in the Americas, but perhaps in other places as well, was to destroy indigenous knowledge systems, which is a concept we'll come back to soon. Um, okay, um, let's talk a little bit, and this will be um, my, last, my last slide, and then I'll ask uh, Beneshi to take over. Um, Let's talk a little bit about colonial economics. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Just wanna confirm that everything is going well. Okay, great. Um, so <clears throat> the way that colonial economics worked, so I don't know if you guys can recognize the scenes on the left. What does, what does the top left look like? No, no worries, Sana, thank you. Um, can anyone tell me what's on the top left? What's being planted there? It's a little hard to see because it's very small in that painting. Um, but the, the mill in the back may give you a clue. Uh, please also explain for our visually impaired um, of course. participants. Of course. So, so uh, on the left side, so I'm presenting a slide with um, four pictures. On the left side is um, a, an agricultural picture. We have some tropical looking trees in the background. Um, some people who look like they are of African descent seem to be planting something. And there's a, a sort of a mill in the back. Um, and to the right of that, and this is the hint, is, uh, is some fancy bottles of rum. So what, what is the raw material in rum? No rum drinkers on the, on the call? I'm sure there must be one or two. Sugar cane. Grains is a good guess, Jogmohan Singji. Um, but not correct. So, so what is being planted there is sugarcane. Um, potato is indeed for vodka, yes. So this is sugarcane. So, so it's important to remember that there were really two in the earlier colonial period and, and even in the later colonial period, there were two or three real treasures. 
that were fought over by the Europeans endlessly. And one was Haiti in the Caribbean because it was the best place for growing sugarcane. And sugarcane was used in the, pro in the production of sugar, molasses, and most importantly, rum. So the way that colonial economics worked was you using slave labor, you keep the cost of the raw material down as far as possible. So that's the sugar. And then you produce it. In the case of sugarcane, it can't actually produce, be produced in, in Europe because sugar goes bad very quickly. Um, but you produce it as, you know, in a way that most of the profit is going to go to Europe. So the second example that I have there is, is more um, accurate in that regard. So you have uh, cotton being produced on the left side there, again, with slave labor. Um, and there's a, the fanciest cotton shirt I could find. I think this is a Louis Vuitton that, that sells for like $6,000 or something. Sorry about that. Um, so you get the idea. The, 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 the value is added in Europe. And even if the value can't be added in Europe, as in the case of sugar, it's still um, the, the money that's generated still ends up in European hands. Um, so just to say last two things about the colonial system. So it's, it's based on commodification. Everything must be commodified, including labor. Um, we've, I, we don't have time here to go into the details of the transatlantic slave trade, but just to say, um, we have discussed it on a previous interview with Bill Fletcher Jr. Um, and I can send links um, to the participants about that as well. Um, but that, that's only one example. I mean, I think when we talk even today about labor markets, um, you know, what does that mean? What does it mean to have a market for labor? Well, we're told by the economists it means that you sell your time to someone else. Um, but I hate to break it to the economists, time can't be sold. I can't sell, I can't sell you a second. <laughs> it's not possible, right? What I can sell is my servitude. During the hours that I work for you or I work for Microsoft or I work for Ford or whatever, um, I'm committing theoretically to not look at Facebook, to not play music, to not write poetry, to not read philosophy, right? I'm committing to be their slave for a certain number of hours per day. I'm, I'm, I'm selling my freedom. So these are concepts that still exist. Um, so co commodification is one piece of it, commodification of everything that can be commodified, including labor. Um, and competition is another key piece of it. So I mentioned that they were competition among kings, but there's also the way that the kings in Europe maintained their power was to ensure that the people underneath them also were competing for favor. So you had different lords of different, and this is why you have so, such complicated hierarchies in European systems. So what's the difference between a duke and a baron? I mean, who knows, right? Um, but those are the hierarchies that allowed, um, allowed for a certain level of competition, which allowed um, the kings on top to maintain control. And when in the colonial context, mm, people were always looking for those divisions. How could you exploit tribal divisions? How could you exploit racial divisions? How could you expo exploit divisions of caste? How could you exploit divisions of religion in order to reinforce European rule? So with that, um, I will hand it over to Vineshi to tell us a little bit more about um, how this played itself out in the Americas. And I welcome Vineshi. Uh, Vineshi, you're very welcome uh, from Peace Vigil, and we look forward to hearing you now. Uh, hello, uh, good afternoon, good afternoon, or good af evening, I guess. Um, it is earlier here. Uh, my name is Benishi Albert. I'm um, Yuchi and Anishinaabe. My mother's people are from southern Canada, and my father's people are from the, the southern part of the United States in Oklahoma. Um, yeah, I don't... Um, so I, I'm going to talk, I will work with an organization called the Indigenous Environmental Network, and um, I'm the movement building coordinator there. And uh, our work as I am is... I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes. possible that you could put your video on? I keep pressing it, and it keeps saying that it's unable to start video because the host has stopped it. Uh, sorry, let me, just, let me just try and fix that. Allow panelists to... Okay, sorry. I think I just fixed that. If you could please try it again. Ah, Ta -da. 
I know I was feeling a little awkward too. I was like, I can't That's see exactly. anything. Also, uh, <laughs> want you to know that we did introduce you. Um, and okay. Also provided a slide uh, for people to read about what you do. And welcome. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, so yeah, I wanted to um, th thank you for the invitation um, to talk about the um, structural systems that exist in the United States that continue to, um, that are a part of the colonial system that continue to impress, um, oppress indigenous peoples um, in the Americas. And so, you know, to, to stretch back to the beginning or, or, you know, the contact that happened here in, in the, the United States and in the Americas uh, was part of the, the sort of empire building that was happening. Um, and so the, you know, first contact um, was early in, you know, in the four, late 1400s. And in that empire building, like the, the goal was really around um, claiming land and claiming property. Um, and yes, there was this voyage, you know, the voyage, the, the story of Columbus coming to the Americas on a voyage to, you know, find another path, you know, passageway to India um, for spice. But in, in reality, all of those voyages were really around claiming land and claiming property and claiming um, the resources of that land. And of those resources, um, there was a lot of um, uh, natural resources um, that were being claimed, but the church was also claiming the inhabitants of those areas. Um, and um, indigenous peoples were one of were one of those um, that were claimed um, as as contact came from you know Spain and Europe and other countries um, claiming that indigenous people was was also part of um, an empire building and and claiming land and property and so early early on the you know one of the very first um, exploitations that happened was in um, exploiting the women, the indigenous women. Um, uh, and, you know, very early on the, the sort of using them um, for sex, uh, rape, all of that happened. Um, but they were used, the women were used as prizes or rewards for the men um, who had sailed with them. And so, and then the other, you know, the other main shift that also came with colonization to the Americas was this concept of uh, dominion. And dominion is still um, causing a great deal of havoc um, in, in our communities and in throughout the Americas. Um, this concept of dominion being that man, human, are over and part of a hierarchy that are over nature. Um, and so that was a that was an ideology that what did not exist here um, in this country or in this in this land. The ideology of like man being over um, nature, over land, and you know. So it today we're still dealing with a lot of um, remnants of that because we live in a capitalist society, a society that. Um, is built on um, exploitation of land, of extraction, um, and using land um, as a means of production um, for building the capitalist system. And because of that, we have lots of um, policies and an economy that is, is based on um, using um, but using in a very aggressive and mass-based system, um, using the natural resources um, that are available to us. And so it has caused an imbalance and a, a, a structural system where indigenous peoples then are fighting to make sure their lands are protected, not just as property, but as where they live and sustain themselves. And, and the systems that they live in um, are not, are, are pushing up against them being able to do that, to live and sustain themselves. 
So you see um, indigenous peoples um, all through the Americas, uh, United States and Canada, who call themselves land protectors, water protectors, um, and even now sky protectors um, of you know, the work that they have to do to protect um, their homelands just to be able to live and sustain themselves. And it's not, it's not even just about property. And so as you move forward through, you know, um, more uh, in the United States, um, you know, we had the early colonial systems also brought um, legal systems to, to this country before it was, you know, before it was called the United States of America. You know, there were the um, British colonies and other colonies that set up here. Um, started um, one both engaging in treaties with indigenous peoples but also a set of laws that also um, controlled indigenous peoples um, so treaties e even in the united states Constitu constitutions treaties are listed as the um, supreme law of the land um, that they should be regarded as such um, that they engaged in these treaties in order to access land um, and, and in exchange um, gave different resources or commitments for resources um, to indigenous peoples. A lot of those um, were around um, land that they would be moving to. I, I come from a group of people, Yuchi people, who were part of the Southeast part of the United States. Um, but we're eventually in a war um, uh, with a, a group of tribes together who went to war against the, um, the, the United States government. Um, and in the end, they lost that war and were forced to remove to Oklahoma. So in that, in that removal, they were walked from one part of the country to another part of the country um, through winter, and actually through a series of um, many years, um, different groups were all forced to walk through um, that countryside. Um, and they call that the Trail of Tears. It's just like a very iconic story about walking from, you know, what is known as, you know, Atlanta or, or Georgia, North Carolina, Alabama, and moving all the way to Oklahoma. But many tribes were moved all from many of their homelands across the country to Oklahoma. So right now what exists as Oklahoma as a state um, is home to 39 tribes that were removed from other parts of the country, not just the Southeast, um, but also in the Northeast, um, the, the Central Valley, um, the Plains, um, and even some in the Southwest. So there's 39 tribes that exist here um, in Oklahoma. And so one of the systems that got instituted in that removal was not only, um, you know, removing them from their homelands, um, but also instituting um, a land ownership system um, that in turn um, facilitated an, a second loss of land of those indigenous peoples. So the commitments were made, like we're removing you from this area and we're moving you here and we're gonna give you a land. And they gave individual allotments to, 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 to people who were removed, right? So each tribe got a land base and, but they gave uh, a certain number of acres to each individual person. And so there were a couple of challenges in that, in that the early allotments only went to men. And so if a woman had been on the, on the trail of tears and lost you know, her husband or lost her father, um, she was not allowed um, to have an allotment of land. Now a family may have adopted her and brought her in and she might've become you know, part of another family that had an allotment of land. Um, but those land allotments went to individuals um, and the boundaries were put in place as the tribes and those lands were held in trust as the tribe, but they went to individuals. Um, 
And so soon after they gave all of the land away to the tribes that they, re they moved there, they had a surplus of land. Um, and so they opened up that middle part of land um, and opened it up for white settlers um, to come and buy that land in this like very dramatic race um, that they called the land run. And you could race and go and stake your claim somewhere and, and do that land. So right in the middle of what was supposed to be one entire state of Indian people called Indian Territory, uh, indigenous peoples there, um, there was a piece in the middle that was surplus land. They opened it up to white settlers in a land run. And as soon as the middle ended up years later, buying the individual allotments that tribal people had, that the indigenous people had, because this idea of ownership over land um, was not a concept. You know, there were indigenous peoples who, you know, they held land and territory in community um, and, and, and in sort of commons, if you will, of the community. Um, they had they had boundaries of mountain ranges or rivers or valleys um, that sort of designated territories of people, but the idea of ownership, the, the idea of a monetary value or a capital value of the ownership of that land was different. So these individual land allotments um, ended up getting bought up by these white settlers who had come in and, and really stolen because not, even though they might have purchased them, they purchased them for like ridiculous amounts of money or trading, you know, a box of food for um, a land deed that people thought were like just pieces of paper. They had no concept um, or little concept that, of, that it belonged to a, a track of land. So today, even though Oklahoma was supposed to be one of Indian territory, um, we don't have reservation lands um, or had in, in, in a good many years because all that land got bought up and was owned uh, privately. However, this year um, we were able to um, have a very um, important decision made about that land and the, and the land base and that the Supreme Court here in the United States ruled that unless an act of Congress changed what was to be Indian territory or tribes having reservations in Indian territory, that unless an act of Congress changed that, it was still deemed to be reservation boundaries. So that decision just came down in July and has caused a great deal of uproar in the state. And all of these families who own um, private land have now come to find out they are within tribal boundaries still. And it's caused, um, you know, the, the governor, um, many of the legislat legislators to panic. Um, but the ruling was really around jurisdiction um, and that, you know, one of the, the the laws that ended up getting implemented um, against Indian people is that they could um, try and convict people on their land, on their reservations, but only of tribal members. So if you're a non-tribal member and you commit a crime on a reservation, um, the tribal community cannot try or convict you. Um, and so this ruling um, has changed some of that jurisdiction um, and mostly still for like tribal members to be tried in their own courts and not of courts of the county or the state, um, but of their own courts. Um, but that's caused a lot of conflict and fear amongst um, landowners who are now feeling like any um, ruling has to do with their land would have to go through tribal courts. So it's a big deal for us that the ruling came down that um, the way that it did, but it has caused a great deal of panic out in the community um, and has caused um, many people to ask the governor and, um, you know, members of the congressional delegation to um, pass legislation that would protect their land, lands that they had taken 
from indigenous peoples, not for the first time, but for the second time. Um, and so these are, you know, land is still very much um, an issue of um, great contention with indigenous communities. And they play out in different ways in different countries. And in the United States, you know, we have um, what we call a tribal sovereignty and sovereignty to um, have our land base and control over what happens in that land base and control over the people. But that sovereignty is given to us um, and, and some of the, the, the concept of sovereignty, um, it, you know, comes from the church and the church saying, oh, we're, we're giving this land, we're giving these land grants, um, and, or even that we're giving recognition of, of tribes. Now, the, the, the right to self-determination um, is our right that we have been born with and that, you know, is inherent to our peoples. And sovereignty um, is often um, also a right that people think is, is we are born to. And, but really it's the right of, of self-determination that we're born, that we are born to or that is inherent to us as, our, as indigenous peoples. Um, but sovereignty is, is based on another body, another government recognizing you and recognizing you as independent and and being sovereign and being able to, you know, determine your own um, fate and business, um, and so it's it's a it's a very complex system, and you know we definitely have big fights of uh, you know and big efforts and struggles around fighting for sovereignty, um, but also deeper struggles around fighting for self determination. Um, and in and in some instances, um, independence. And so there are many um, tribes in in this country. Um, I come from a tribe that is not individually federally recognized. Um, it's not recognized by the federal government. It is recognized by the state government that I live in, um, and um, and we are recognized as part of the Muscogee Creek Nation. And in that recognition, each individual um, belongs to a nation. Um, and so this is another system of a colonial system that was imposed upon us, um, is that each nation an indigenous nation. And while we feel power in that, um, it also means that we are, um, we are bound to a system of blood quantum. And blood quantum has to do with um, uh, the amount of your ancestry and lineage that is from um, and most tribes um, operate on systems of blood quantum. Um, and as a individual, you can only belong um, tribe or nation, um, and that belonging is based on your, your parents being full blood or 100 um, of that um, tribal nation. So in the example of my people, um, while I am 100% indigenous, my mother is from Canada and from a tribal nation in Canada, and my father is from a tribal nation in Oklahoma in the United States. So in the United States, I am only um, listed as half indigenous or half Native American um, or half Yuchi. And that is, it's even less than that because my father is two tribes. So my father is half Yuji, which makes me one quarter Yuji. So it's a system, it's like a pedigree system that only exists for, you know, horses or dogs in this country and then indigenous people that we have to be 
pedigreed and, and listed how much blood belongs to an indigenous nation that we can then identify for. Um, and so this is a this was a system um, set up by the colonial government in you know the late 1800s um, to say that you belong to a nation and if you married somebody who was from a different nation, you had to declare you belong to your mother's people or your father's people, but you couldn't belong to both, even though culturally um, and um, culturally you could both you could be part of both cultures and language and speak both languages, um, but on paper and in the eyes of the federal government, you could only belong to one. So that was a that was a colonial system that still exists today and has now been incorporated much into the um, indigenous identity of indigenous peoples of the United States. And in, in times it's caused great conflict um, between people and it's it's caught it's it's been instilled as a, um, a cultural value sometimes when people say oh well they're not a full blood or they're a thin blood you know sometimes people say oh they're thin blood meaning they have very little in blood um, and so it's a strange system but there are some tribes who are using their autonomy as the sovereign indigenous nations to change how they identify their members of their tribal nation. And, and there are some tribes now who are using ancestry um, and not blood quantum to identify their, their um, citizens. Um, and it has allowed people to access in a different way um, to be recognized by the federal government. And part of that recognition is important because it allows people to access some of the resources that were negotiated in, in many of the treaties that the US government made with tribal nations around land. Um, and so the main things that were um, committed to was a specific land base that they had been moved to or that they had um, were originally their land and they said these are now our boundaries so that so land is one of them um, access to health care um, and a commitment to health care was one and a commitment to education um, and so you know the education piece was an effort around um, assimilating indigenous people making them civilized and having them sort of um, be in a policy that was basically called Kill Indian, Save the Man. Um, but in contemporary times, that access to education um, is, presents itself as um, scholar, scholarships and grants for indigenous peoples to attend um, colleges and universities. Um, and, and so those, those are why the, this concept of being able and belonging to a tribal nation and um, with or without it being related to blood quantum has been important to indigenous peoples. And the contradiction that we live in constantly is this idea of dismantling and undoing those systems um, and at the same time holding the federal government accountable to commitments that they made under those systems. So those two efforts are in constant tension with each other, that we're saying, this is not a system that is ours. Our governments are organized based on a corporate system um, from colonial sources. Our traditional forms and mechanisms of government were erased and replaced with um, what they call IRA governments, Indian Reorganization Act governments. Um, and so all of the things are like we're in constant flux of both trying to undo some of those systems, undo systems of blood quantum, undo systems of land ownership, undo systems of um, governance, and at the same time hold the U.S. government accountable to commitments they made around land and, and access to land around healthcare, around education, 
around property rights or restriction. Um, and so it's, it's sometimes a struggle to like manage those and, and balance those struggles and tensions together. I will stop there for now. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Patricia. That's really interesting. I just want to, uh, before I hand over to Ross again, I just want to highlight a couple things from, from your presentation, which is, um, I think one thing that came up is that the, the, the battles, and, and sometimes those of us who aren't in the Americas don't hear these stories, but the battles between um, the colonizers and um, the colonized began immediately. They began in, in 1492, or whenever these, these folks first came. And they didn't end until Trail of Tears is 19th century, right? I mean, so that's, that's 400. Oh, no, they're still, they're still existing today. <laughs> but, but I mean, the armed, I guess I mean the armed conflict. So the armed conflict lasts for about 300 years, yeah? Yeah? Yeah. And then, then you have a forced displacement. And by the way, in the context of what Rossigan's about to say, the reservation system in North America paved the way for the Bantustan and similar systems here in Southern Africa as well. Um, so that's one very clear piece that's come out from your presentation. The second piece is this idea of everything having to be commodified, including especially the land. And even land which was set aside for indigenous peoples, and then they decided that it was good for farming, or maybe they found some oil on it or something, and then immediately there were steps taken to undo that, right? Or to 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 mm -hmm. further to re to re-displace people, to re-commodify the land, um, and to move people even further. And the third theme that I see coming up is this idea of competition. So this idea of um, are you native enough to get this privilege, which shouldn't actually be a privilege, it should be a human right. Everyone should have a decent education and everyone should be able to go to a university. Um, Absolutely. But, but we're competing amongst ourselves for, these, for the scraps, right? And that brings to the, the fourth theme that I hear in your presentation, which is that there's a tension between the demand for structural change. And I think, again, this is something that we're gonna hear uh, again in the South African case. There is a demand for complete transformation, complete overhaul, a kind of a revolution. This, this, um, we don't accept the colonial uh, law. We don't ex accept your courts. We don't accept your rules. On the one hand, there's, there's, that's a valid thing to say. But on the other hand, it's also valid to say that according to your rules that you set, you have made commitments which you have not lived up to. Um, and the problem is that that sounds like a contradiction, but, but it really shouldn't be. Did I get it right? Yes. Okay, cool. Yes. Fantastic. So we'll come back to that. Um, could, we, um, could we then, uh, I'll, I'll turn my video off and you can also turn your video off and we'll give it over to, to Rasigan. Rasigan, please go ahead. Welcome uh, Rasigan Maharaj. Uh, we are very happy you're with us today. We are all eager to learn about you. Thank you very much, uh, Shireen. Uh, greetings, Banesh, greet me and all of the good people that are on the call itself. You know, I really could feel, Banesh, as you were presenting, a lot of resonance with what you were raising. But at the same time, in the cell that I live in, uh, I'm also heard that the places that in people or the territory known as the America underwent much deeper and a longer period of subjugation than even the territories of Africa itself. And maybe as a way of, uh, of softening the point I've just made, an interesting um, question that we could ask of all of us that are supposedly Homo sapiens sapiens today, and we can find out what percentage uh, in our genetic makeup draws us back to our origins. And it's that, those origins that we find on the continent of Africa itself, largely between the Rift Valley and uh, the Gauteng province in South Africa, we have an arc. And this arc provides us, at least in terms of the uh, uh, verifiable evidence of our origins as a species being. 
And uh, Samir is absolutely correct in terms of uh, the, uh, the stylized uh, versions of an evolutionary progression being a complete fallacy, usually dreamed up by the person uh, who caricatures themselves as being the objective of this progression. In other words, the person places themselves at the end of evolution and everything else percolates towards it. So I think that that point is quite important also for another reason. And as a way of sequing into uh, the points that I will be raising uh, for us to engage with, I think it's important to separate out at least the material components around colonialism, imperialism, and the intellectual components. Of course, these go together, very much like the hand and the mind work together. Um, I'm not so sure about uh, that in contemporary, uh, what's called the United States of America, because we often see the hand acting and uh, it takes us a while to, to, to realize what the mind was actually thinking, especially um, the institution Beneshi, that you referred to as the federal government. So uh, if I could then uh, step into this area around, most of what I'm going to speak about is about the material side of history. And uh, very much like Beneshi gave us a, a summary version, the periodization that I'm going to deal with, I'm also going to, to make quite brief and concentrated. Uh, um, and uh, through this, I hope we get things of the, the wider uh, intellectual issues that float as well. And I'll try to talk about some of them. Uh, 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 introduction, uh, point about a dominant single collective uh, being put forward as important. It, it even gives us a uh, a definition of our timeline, which we call a common era. But we need to question the commonness of that era and, and what it actually does to us. And I want to even hazard uh, or speculate that the single narrative, because it's imbued with dominance and violence, tends to act as a binding constraint that then prevents the plurality of what is humanity uh, uh, being able to achieve the form of self-determination, I think I heard you speak about the issue. So in the long run of history, um, our species being anatomically modern human beings, who supposedly are wise, hence the sapien uh, uh, appellation, uh, has a history about 250,000 uh, years ago. And in the southern parts of Africa, we have evidence, at least from 150,000 years ago, of hunter-gatherer communities establishing themselves and to some extent settling. We can say with a lot of certainty that by the period uh, uh, a century before the common era, that these hunter-gatherer communities had established viable communities. And in fact, we do then see evidence of a more pastoral uh, lifestyle emerging as well. You know, um, there are other aspects uh, based on the geophysical location of Southern Africa, um, which then allowed the indigenous peoples to come into contact with metals and minerals. And so we have evidence from at least the year 200 of the common era of uh, mining and use of copper and iron. I, I, I'm saying this uh, because this is a history that's often excluded in the way in which history is taught in South Africa, even post the democratic breakthrough of 1994. Um, by, by the period 250 to 500 of the common era, we'd, we also have evidence quite established of a huge variety of language groups and uh, cultures associated with them. Uh, large communities uh, 
referred to as Nguni people, uh, Pedi, uh, Venda, Tswana, Tsonga. These are different language groups um, that have settled right across uh, Southern Africa with the huge concentration in the southernmost point. Around the year 1000, um, which would uh, place it a century after the gunpowder you mentioned in China, uh, Samir. Uh, bronze uh, use and uh, gold working or working of fine artifacts in gold is quite prevalent in southern the first millennium birth of southern Africa and um, these settlements are quite large relatively prosperous in terms of being able to provide surpluses that allow for accumulation and I, I now say this much more guardedly. I worry about us using this language in how we describe the indigenous peoples of the earth, uh, even though they are rendered in, our, uh, in the work that we are doing and in the writings that we produce. So uh, around the millennium until uh, the, thir um, the 13th uh, century, the Mapgube kingdom, is seen as a large and important node that links with the great Zimbabwe and connects with quite a vibrant Indian Ocean um, uh, centered uh, trade regime. I mean, included in there would be the story that Samir shared earlier about the giraffe. Uh, I'm not so convinced that uh, uh, genetic modification or uh, people doing uh, creating a uh, life forms in laboratories was as advanced that the giraffe was created in India and just moved to China. I think at that point, maybe organically, it was a giraffe from Africa that maybe uh, found its way across via the different territories of the Indian Ocean as well. So by 1200, we have a community mining and using tin and a whole range of, of, of of really vibrant societies can be seen to exist in Southern Africa. Now, uh, by the year 1400, uh, the Amakosa are seen as a major community in the Eastern Cape. Uh, the Mutapa Empire, which is a little bit to the north and extends into what we know as Mo uh, Mozambique, as well as the Batua Kingdom, uh, which follows it. Now, I mention all of that because most of that history, we are only now coming to engage with uh, in, in much deeper terms, coming to appreciate and understand. Why? Because South Africa in 1652 was victim to being captured by a corporation uh, based in the Netherlands, the Dutch East India Company, um, established a refreshment station. That's the alternative to the pewter uh, Columbus looking west to head east. And this is where people basically try to come around Africa to enter the Indian Ocean itself. And that settlement from then establishes primarily a form of private property, which would then accumulate and give us the complexion of today's inequalities in South Africa. To some extent, that establishes the original sin upon which the capitalist framework was able to evolve. So South Africa's capitalism itself was forged in very racialized terms. And the races as they were then uh, uh, determined uh, and allowed for categorization would be a phenomena that was more pronounced in the 19th and 20th century than earlier than that. And it's not just the indigenous peoples of, of, of Southern Africa 
that were incorporated into the system. Slavery played a big part and uh, a whole variety of ancestry uh, then links with peoples from uh, Southeast Asia, with people from uh, East Asia, uh, as well as along the entire East Coast of Africa uh, and even uh, to Western Central Africa. So we've, we've got much more of a fluid pattern. And that's also something I'd want to pick up in conversation, Beneshi, about how settled communities actually were as opposed to being much more mobile and being able to, to move around as opposed to being fixed and locked into particular spaces. A lot of the history, especially around hunter-gathering, uh, the development of alternative capabilities, etc., were all premised on developing these capabilities and capacities. And we did that by moving around, by following um, uh, herds of animal or for, uh, uh, of moving towards territories which had the necessary fruit and, uh, and vegetables that we were seeking as well. So uh, I also like the way in which you invoke the notion of dominion. What follows from dominion is of course domination. It, it's very closely related also to the metabolic rift, the split between our own pattern and uh, um, pace of evolutionary change relative to the environment around us. Our separation from that, I think then sets us uh, uh, along uh, a pathway which runs in parallel with South Africa's history. It's important as well noting there isn't a South Africa until the year 1910. So that 250 some odd years between 1652 uh, and the establishment of the Union of South Africa uh, does not have a parallel uh, in the United, uh, in the north, uh, northern parts of America, because uh, the, the French incursion, as you've mentioned as well, happened much earlier. So a key point in South Africa's, colo uh, the expansion of the settlers from being located in the Cape Part of the expansion inland from the Cape was a direct response to the abolition of slavery. So those that support the idea of slavery being uh, determined to be an illegal form of labor exploitation uh, moved outside of the boundaries. In other words, outside of the legal jurisdiction within which slavery was no longer legal. But I, but I want to encourage uh, people to, to, uh, to, to pay much more attention. Uh, at the end, uh, and with Shireen and uh, Samir's permission, I'll also share with you a book launch that's taking place in this week coming with some excellent material about this early history in Southern Africa itself. But a lot of uh, the enumeration that was taking place showed that for the settler community, they themselves had a multiple in terms of numbers of slaves attached to them. And I'd be quite concerned if we were to take the numbers of uh, uh, settlers to include those in unfree labor, but serving the needs of the settlers itself. Yeah. So there's three or four more points that I uh, want to get to also very rapidly. And that is similar to in, uh, what is now the United States of America, the rediscovery of mineral wealth then spurs uh, a much larger, almost invasion of peoples from the rest of the world trying to access that. So diamonds were found in the late 1800s and gold was rediscovered. I want to emphasize that point, gold was rediscovered because we have artifacts made from gold that predate its so-called discovery uh, in South Africa. Uh, the establishment of a racial capitalism in South Africa, um, I think largely describes what happens subsequently. And a competition for resources amongst uh, white settlers 
saw a division between those that supposedly orientated themselves to the United Kingdom and uh, those that did not, that were more European orientated. In South Africa, this took the form of an English versus Afrikaans language group uh, conflict. And that conflict would largely shape uh, 19th and 20th century history of South Africa. By the 20th century, and in fact, 50 years before the millennium, 1948, um, in South Africa, uh, a particular virulent form of this racist, uh, Calvinist uh, uh, grouping took power. I say took power because even though they won the election, it was an election only for white people, uh, for white candidates. Having won power, they then put in place a much more elaborate form of what we now know as apartheid, and apartheid would continue until 1994. So if I deal with the current legacies, they are the material aspects which speak to um, uh, people's dispossession, the lack of acquisition and the capacity then to accumulate, intergenerational poverty, unemployment that continues um, generation by generation, uh, and exclusion largely having your entire body, your way of thinking, uh, removed from even popular culture and how that's reflected back at you. So all of those material aspects have a very direct impact upon how intellectually or conceptually we make sense of the world. And I think this has been dealt with before, but largely the ideas that come from the global south and that permeate uh, the majority uh, black communities in South and Southern Africa have been treated then as anomalies. And these are histories that we are only now starting to rewrite and bring back to the fore as contained within there are huge amounts of very valuable information, especially as we uh, now deal with the ecological catastrophe confronting us. So I hope that's all right, uh, Samira. I've tried to do a lot of history in a short period of time. <laughs> no, it's, it's a pleasure, Russ. Again, I, there's just a couple of things that I want to highlight before I, I let, you, let you go. And you can clarify my highlighting. I mean, I guess, um, I guess one point is that, um, as you say, this region, Southern Africa, was already very fluid. And we had many different ethnic groups, some so-called um, Bantu-speaking, and some that probably were here before that. They were definitely here before that, and, and at least two different groups within that. So just to say that this is, this is as you say, it's a, it's, a, it's a place that may have given birth to humankind, or one of the places that may have given birth to humankind. And also that by the time the Europeans get here, it's not just one civilization. There are sort of many different civilizations, just as in the Americas, that are sort of um, down interacting and not always friendly. I mean, there are wars and all these kind of things too. Um, that's, that's sort of one point that I just want to make sure that it's highlighted for, for our listeners. Um, the second point is that when Europeans come, they, unlike in the Americas, they didn't necessarily want to colonize, right? And what, one point that I'm not sure came up in the presentation, that the people who ended up colonizing were like sometimes prisoners. I mean, they were, they were sort of, um, pe prisoners also, I mean, I, I think we want to be a little bit loose with that term. People who were escaping some kind of religious persecution, so we can talk about the French Huguenots and so on. These were sort of marginal people within the Americas who ended up, ended up here, yeah, ended up in Southern Africa. Uh, there was a, a petition, I don't know if you follow this, by some Afrikaner groups uh, like 20 years ago or something to be recognized as indigenous peoples. Do, do you know, are you aware of that, that one? So it's, it's yeah. very strange. Um, the, the specific history and how people see themselves here is, is quite strange. Um, so even within the settler colonial narrative, uh, there are stories of victimization that happen. But then again, you know, just to, to begin with the, with the story in, in North America, again, it becomes a story of a, of a gold rush, of a diamond rush of resources that are really um, take precedence over any kind of indigenous people's rights. And I wonder if, if I can ask you just a little bit uh, maybe on labor, because I think when, when they found the mines and when they found the diamonds and so on, 
they didn't have enough people to work them. And so how did they deal with that, with that question? Uh, uh, thanks very much, Samir. An excellent summary as well. <laughs> summary of the summary as we're moving into this. Uh, I, I, I tried to make the point earlier, and even the settlers, when they arrived originally, um, very quickly realized that the local people had no interest in working for someone else. In other words, exchanging their labor. Why? Because to a large extent, they were self um, uh, they were capable of generating what they required to reproduce themselves. So there was a need then to force people into labor. This was largely unsuccessful, and large numbers of local people were, uh, died in these processes. Um, and the consequence was the imported slaves. And this continued as wars were fought over territories and people marginalized and kept being forced into smaller and smaller pieces of land. Uh, th th this did not change the propensity of the local people to be able to feed themselves. So the compulsion to actually work needed to be enacted through legal means supported violence. And this took the form of va various monetary taxes which meant that people could not pay this in terms of food stocks or livestock, but had to pay it in terms of currency. And those currencies could only then be accessed uh, through exchanging it for labor. People found a way around that by trading goods. So, you know, uh, my ancestors or some of my ancestors arrived in this country in, 18, uh, in the territory of Southern Africa in 1860 as a part of indentured uh, um, servitude. So that was a way in which large numbers of people were brought into something. It did not only mean people were brought from outside of the continent. People were recruited from Malawi, uh, basically from Central Africa southwards, Malawi, Zambia, uh, across to Angola, across Mozambique on the other side, and everything to the south. People were drawn into this. And it was largely then paying taxes, which was the motivation. The motivation wasn't, I want to work. The motivation was to pay a tax or I will be evicted from this land. Hence, exchanging labor for that purpose itself. Hmm? Uh, I hope that's clear enough, uh, Samir. Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, Benishi, did you want to, to comment on here? Sorry, you're on mute still. I was like, I, I feel like there's hundred things I would like. <laughs> I, I, but I was thinking about the, this piece around um, the means of labor and the timing of that, right? Because in the Americas, uh, the it supposedly was to find another route to India. Um, and you know, ended up lost at sea somewhere and, and landed in what is as the Caribbean in that area there. Um, but the peoples of the, what would be Central America when they came more to the mainland, um, you know, those were, those were civilizations, right? And, and yes, there were nomadic people, but they were also built structured cities, right? And so that's what the, those are, encountered and already commerce and and economy going on there um, but then it became this battle of like we want to claim that or we want to find the gold or or whatever it was right um but the later the later colonization um been the colonies in um the united states what became the united states that means of labor did necessitate uh, bringing slave Africa right? like that that was a key moment in history because the you know when Columbus came he had a whole lot of folks with them they tried to enslave in, in the battle in what was the United States it was the slave trade from Africa that that set those colonies to expand and exist on a different level 
just uh, interesting to think about the time frame that you're talking about 1600 and what happened here in the United States in that same time frame, very closely related. 100%. And, and you know, one of the, it, it's in South Africa, it's interesting because we talk about, you know, there were slaves being, sorry, enslaved people who were being sold into slavery. Um, not so much from Cape Town, although that did happen to some extent. Ross again will correct me if I'm wrong, but a little bit later than that. But people were being brought in, people who were already enslaved were being brought in from Asia. Um, and that's a whole different, and, and that started in the 17th century itself, in the 1600s itself, right? So it's like this, um, this institution, <laughs> this sort of, I mean, I'm not saying that Europeans invented slavery, but, but there's a certain, there's a certain model that they followed um, that was fueling a labor supply here and then also extracting a labor supply from Africa and taking it to the Americas. So it, it is indeed interesting. Um, if you guys don't mind, we, we'll go very quickly to, uh, to India. And um, uh, sorry, I will just um, take us back to the, uh, the, the PowerPoint. Um, and then I'll, I'll try and do this within 10 minutes and then we will go straight to a question and answer. If, um, so please, uh, please, as I'm presenting, please feel free to um, continue to write your comments in, um, in the chat box. Uh, please also people who are watching it on Facebook, um, you know, there are like 34 or 35 shares that have happened and people are uh, writing to the Peace Vigil WhatsApp uh, message. Uh, because of some technical issues with Facebook. Um, uh, but people are watching and sending in their questions, which I, I will be or Samir will be sharing soon. I would just remind that if you use any slides for the benefit of people who don't have a screen or are visually impaired, please uh, just quickly let them know what your screen uh, is saying or what the picture is. Thank Fantastic. You. No, I'm the only one who's, uh, who's who's making the mistake of using PowerPoint today. Apologies for that. This is a, a picture of, uh, well, can anyone tell me who this is a picture of? We should be able to guess. Uh, thank you, Ram Murtiji, for your questions. This is a picture of a woman um, who's sitting on a big throne wearing a, a crown. Um, and the hint is that she's an empress and she's just been crowned an empress. So this is Queen Victoria who is the first empress of India, supposedly, um, the first British empress of India. Um, and I mean, there's a myth <clears throat> about how Europeans conquered, um, well, what is, let's stick to what is today India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Um, and you can see this, and as I was researching this presentation, I found some history books that talked about European rule over India started in, starting in 1505. Um, that 1505 is the year that some Portuguese uh, traders first established some kind of very small trading post in what is today Goa. Um, but I wouldn't call that colonialism. Certainly it's not equivalent to what we've been talking about in the Americas and South Africa, at least not yet. Um, so, you know, in terms of when formal control over the majority of the territory that we now call India, Pakistan and Bangladesh happened, it did not happen until 1857. So I think that's important to recognize. I've given you here, so here I've, uh, the, the PowerPoint has some, um, some little dots. The little dots on the left are of Danish settlements. So um, interestingly, it's not just Portugal, uh, Netherlands, England, and France that had co uh, colonial outposts. Um, Denmark also had some very few um, trading posts. So it, it, the Calicut is listed here. Um, a place called uh, the Nicobar Islands is listed there. Um, and a couple places in Bengal there. Um, so, and on the, on the right are the Portuguese settlements. Those are obviously more numerous. Um, but still, if you take all of those Portuguese settlements together, I, they don't add up to 1% of the territory of, of what we today call India. So, it's just not accurate to say that the Europeans uh, were in control for, for that long. Um, the British East India Company was defeated in 1690. So, so even in 1690, they didn't have control over much of the territory. Um, they were re defeated resoundingly and were fined. They were fined the equivalent of 
$1.6 million uh, in today's dollars. So it's not a small fine that they had to pay in order to continue there, otherwise they would have been kicked out completely. Um, it's not until a little bit later, um, so that, and uh, so on the, on the left here, I have a picture of a, a, an official from the British East India Company planting a flag. He's being welcomed by some friendly looking Indians uh, and including an elephant on the left there. It, this is obviously Europe, uh, Eurocentric um, Orientalist art. Um, and on the right, I have a picture of the territories that the British East, East India controlled uh, circa 1750. And uh, you'll see that it just includes what is today Bang uh, West Bengal and Bangladesh and parts of Andhra Pradesh um, and um, what is today um, Hyderabad um, and also Bombay. So, <clears throat> um, so what happens between this time and 1857 is that the company expands and they expand two ways. Uh, one, they expand in the same colonial trade model that I talked about earlier. So they're in Bengal specifically, they are exporting cheap cotton and importing finished materials as shirts. They're also outlawing the production of finished goods, finished clothes and so on. So the only clothes that Bengali people can buy are those that are produced in England, right? And that gives them a captive market. So they're using that to make lots and lots of money. They've also deindustrialized people. Bengal was a, a very industrial, it was, it was competing um, in production for, with um, locomotives as late as 1800. So they, they de-industrialized uh, that part of India, uh, sent people to the countryside. Uh, Amartya Sen, Indian economist Amartya Sen has a whole um, book about how these policies caused famines and killed millions of people all over Bengal. Um, so they're, essentially they're taking money out of through raw materials, they're taking money out of the territory they control and they're using that money to fuel their own wars. So they're at war all over the rest of the country, but even in 1857, they did not control a majority of the territory that we today call India. Um, instead, that was you know, largely controlled uh, by various remnants of the Mughal Empire. Um, and I can go into more detail if people have questions during the question and answer. Um, <clears throat> Now, 1857, we don't have time to go into here. Um, in India, we call that the first, uh, first independence war. Uh, the British call it the, the mutiny, the, the 1857 mutiny, or sometimes called the Sepoy mutiny. Um, so this war, which the British almost lost, and in fact, uh, Professor Shamsul Islam, who's also on the call, has a great book about how um, the British very nearly lost this war uh, in Delhi. Um, the, the British thought that internal divisions between the peoples of India were too great for any kind of internal unity. They looked at the caste system, they looked at religious differences, and they said, these people are never going to get, uh, get together and fight us. And they knew they could defeat any one king um, or any one tribe. They could defeat them on their own. But if all of them united, they knew that they had a problem. So post-1857, and this is the period when the British East, East, East India Company rule is no longer there and you have formal rule from uh, London, from, from the Empress, from Queen Victoria. So they, they really step up their game in terms of divide and rule. They step up their game in terms of divide and rule and they form separate uh, societies, separate kinds of, of elite societies, especially for Muslims. Specific importance was British support for um, Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan, who was the founder of the Aligarh Muslim uh, University and a number of uh, other organizations as well. Um, the British claim that they are supporting uh, these groups to sort of uplift the, the quote unquote backward uh, Muslim masses. And there certainly is an element of truth to that. Um, you know, even today, the Muslim community in India by and large is, is quite poor. Um, but this had the effect of, um, you know, the impression was that there is a, a Muslim only space that you've created, for example, with the All India Muslim League. And that therefore there can, it's okay to have all Hindu only spaces. So um, in the 20th century, now we've, we've gone to the 20th century, those divide and rule tactics go into a higher gear. Um, on one side was the attempted and then successful partition of Bengal. I think it's worth spending a moment on that because, um, you know, when we read about this in the history books, we again learn that it's, it's one side was a Muslim majority and the other side was a Hindu majority. And that's why it was partitioned in 1905. 
Um, I don't believe that that's the case. I believe um, Bengal, United Bengal functioned as one economic unit with um, agriculture rich East Bengal, what is today Bangladesh, um, giving raw material for industry rich uh, West Bengal, uh, what is today Indian West Bengal. So um, by dividing that, the British could have much better control over the whole uh, situation. Um, so you have those, uh, the policy of dividing Bengal, you also have the Morlo, Morley Minto reforms that promise separate electorate for Muslims. And as a direct response to that, you have the, the beginnings of the, what will later become the, um, the Hindu Mahasabha. Um, so the, the beginnings of what we today call Hindutva are really um, at that point in our colonial past. Um, and the result of all this, and of course, we don't have time to go into this in the short presentation, the result of all this is the actual partition of India into three countries, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Um, I wanted to end with this slide um, just to, to laugh a little bit. Um, but also to sum up with, with this, that the, the politics of this, the politics of unity and division was always um, contested. There are moments in the not too distant past, and we've discussed some of them on previous webinars with Professor Jagmohan Singh. Um, so there are moments in the not too distant past when some degree of unity seemed possible. 1857 was such a moment, perhaps uh, moments in the independence movement prior to 1947 were also such moments. Uh, the second thing I'll say by way of summary is that I think the British learned a lesson from what happened in the US in 1776. Uh, in 1776, the British lost formal control of um, what we've been discussing as the USA, um, but they were able to maintain trade relations, and really that's all they wanted. Um, the US, you know, this is another thing that we didn't get into yet, but the US was very keen on its policy of expansion. And one of the reasons that they were upset at the British was that the British were demanding um, adherence to the sovereignty rights um, that Native Americans, the agreements that Native Americans had signed with the British before 1776. So in fact, many um, Native American tribes sided with the British against um, the US colonists, uh, which then the US colonists used an ex as an excuse to further persecute them after 1776 happened or further disenfranchise them from their land. Um, so, um, so trade was the main thing for the British. Uh, and when we look at you know, the relationships between British and, and the US and, and India, um, we really see that trade relations continue to be the main issue, um, going even to the current moment, talk about a US-India trade deal and so on. So, um, and those trade agreements continue the colonial pattern of economics. India is there as a producer of raw materials and as a market, other countries, whether they're Europe or the US, are there to do the things that will actually add value. We call them manufacturer value add, MVA. So those countries will make more money. India will lose money in all of these deals. Um, and the last thing I'll say by, just as a, by way of summary is to say that the reaffirmation of caste, gender, and religious difference in modern India is a, a victory of colonial era divide and rule policies. Reformers pushed slightly in the direction of secularism, in the direction of Dalit rights, and in the direction of some kind of feminism. And these, I, I have in mind the era between say 1950 and 1980. Um, the reaction to this was, um, so these were slight reformers. I don't think these were revolutionaries. I'm talking about Nehruvian reforms. Um, the reaction to those reforms, and you just have to look at what Modi says about Nehru, um, has pushed India probably to a more divided state and a more sort of racist and casteist and patriarchal state uh, than it was even in 1947. Uh, so it really is a victory of, of um, I, I would argue, a kind of colonial divide and rule policy in a way that no one was expecting. So with that, um, I will wrap up and, and hand it over to um, anyone who would like to ask questions, in, including any of the panelists. I think there are some questions that are already there and I will read them out. Um, Ram Murthy, G is asking, what do you think the most common characteristic feature of colonization across India, South Africa, and North America? Secondly, uh, why don't indigenous tribal nations of the US assert for a separate nation? Um, Aradita says there's always unity among fascists. 
Uh, Sana says, can the panelists speak a bit more on how post-colonial nations using colonial models themselves and where that fits into the story, for example, West and East Pakistan, colonial economic pattern or settler colonial tactic being used in Kashmir. I wonder, can I direct the question about, um, uh, is there a, an indigenous tribal nation of the US, a demand for a separate nation? Can I direct that to you, Vineshi? Um, so uh, the, the indigenous tribal nations, I will say nations, there are over 500 distinct cultural identity groups recognized by the federal government. Um, 560 something years from time to time. And those are ones the federal government recognizes. It doesn't account for others. And so you're talking about people who have very um, distinct cultures from each other, languages from each other. Some of them have land-based, some don't. And part of the colonial structure of setting reservations um, uh, by design, by design made it so that people thought people, indigenous people had to believe what well, this is our peace and like it shouldn't be shared with anyone else. Right. And so um, part of that colonial structure has facilitated, um, just like Samira was sharing, has facilitated a continuation of uh, disunity around creating what would be an, um, a separate nation. And if you look at the these like those reservation communities are very few and far between. And I was hoping I might be able to um, share an image with you all so that D. Let me see if I pull it up real quick. Um, the the yeah the loss of land that has happened. The res the land base that exists now is not um, contiguous. It's not contained in one spot, right? So to separate from a nation, you would have small, small people. And so there's not a, like, you wouldn't have a sort of one group of people all together. The closest would be um, uh, Oklahoma, which has 39 um, tribes. Um, or Navajo Nation, um, which has a very, which has one of the largest reservation land bases in the United States. Um, so here is a map I want to share with you quick. And it's a map of the United States and the blue shows the time period um, from uh, 1776 to present. Um, and the image is, is, is a map and it's showing how um, the loss of land that has happened from indigenous peoples. So now what exists is a couple of little red spots of tribal nation lands. So you see those tribal nations are not, with the exception of a few, they're not close um, together to have one land base to be identified as a separate nation. Thanks so much. That's such a fascinating um, and depressing um, picture. Um, I have a question from our WhatsApp um, study group participant. His name is uh, Vinay. Um, Vinay asks, uh, I think this is a question for Rasigan. Uh, what's your view of social grants? While I support it in theory, it makes people into um, receivers, which takes their dignity away from them and makes others look at them as beggars. Did you want to have a go at that one, Rasigan? Uh, I, imagine, I would encourage Vinay as well. Um, you know, we've been speaking about history and our pasts. How far backward, Vinay, would you go before you found out that your money is not worth anything? In other words, where the instrument inserted into your hand that you now feel we are dependent upon it? This is part and parcel, I think, of the lesson, that gap between material and intellectual. And the way in which the intellectual world then comes to pre what are material possibilities. The issues about the grants currently, and I think we have to be quite clear about it, we have a contemporary debate around a universe.
basic income guarantee. It may take the form of a grant, etc. But that's because of the excessive, <laughs> it's such a strange thing, the excessive surplus extraction that's been taken. And it's a form of redistribution to get this back. So I'm sorry, I, I, I do not feel any resonance towards this notion that people are inherently lazy and waiting for handouts. People not. It's the system that costs people, I'm using the word deliberately, as such. And we reproduce it in the way in which we think about the world. So we really have to achieve a decoloniality, even in about contemporary issues. Because all of this weight of, that map that you showed us, Bineshi, I could play the same map to you from South Africa and Palestine, and that's, that's not going forward. <laughs> this acquisition, appropriation, and it's mine. And therefore, I will give you some charity. We have to really change that base, and I really engage more about that. Uh, this is a question from Susan. Uh, on WhatsApp uh, from our uh, study group. Uh, this question is directed to Professor Rasigan. Are there any mines in South Africa where the indigenous people lived and have fought for that space? So, uh, I'm sorry, I'll be very quick on this one. It's just because of the tools and technologies and over time itself. So when you go looking for a mine today, you probably are looking at an image that post colonial. In other words, it's got bricks around it, it's got a roof on top, etc. When we're looking across the thousands of years, such town planning and rules did not exist. So why we've now made this a rediscovery of many of the indigenous mines and metalworking facilities is what we found. They were made of organic materials. The bellows were made of skins and the rest constructed out of mud, the mud and clay. So over time, these have eroded. So to an extent, uh, it's not so much people had a large mine that they had to defend. It wasn't like a, an industrial setting that we know today. These were much smaller groups that produced ore, that smelted it, and worked it. So in that, I'm sure the individual homestead would have protected it against invasion. But there wasn't as if you had the whole of South Africa's indigenous communities protecting the diamonds, gold, etc. It did not even have the same form of value that we give it today. Fantastic, thanks. Before we move forward, so there's a couple of questions I, I want to um, address to myself, if I may. Uh, but before we do that, Beneshi, I, I, could you respond also to this question? The, the terminology is different. So in the U.S., we talk about welfare and, and things like that, and not social grants. But I think it's a, I think it's a very apt question. The question that Rossigan uh, answered. What, what would you say to that one? I mean, it's a, it, it, it's a very like important issue here. Um, in the United States and in Canada, because it has um, instilled uh, a really, uh, a really insidious hatred and uh, and racism around um, Indigenous people getting free stuff, or that it's tax free, or we're getting some kind of thing for free that we were given land for free, um, and so the concept of giving us our own land. <laughs> And, 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 and so people like, yes, it, it's caused a lot of racism, um, indigenous peoples and the, the non-native townships that are adjacent to reservation communities. There's lots of racism um, because of this concept of us getting something for free. Care is free or education is free. You're getting free gas. I don't know where the free gas came from. I don't know where that's happening because it doesn't happen with it. Um, but um, it, it, it's caused a lot of tension, a lot of violence. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's based on like people's lack of understanding the context of the treaties that were made and the treaties agreements give us in exchange 
we are making these commitments to you for in perpetuity, right? There was no end term to those treaties. Um, there was no end term to those treaties. Th those commitments were in exchange for land. And so people these days, a lot of indigenous peoples these days are like, fine, don't give us those things, give us the land back, right? <laughs> give us the land back. You can have the free health care. you can have the education, give us the land back. Um, and that's a pretty strong refrain that many people and many young people today are making is give us the land back. And some tribal nations, some of the nations have gotten so successful at the business structures that the government set up, you know, saying you need to operate in this way. They've gotten so successful at that, that they have been buying land back. And in the state that I live in Oklahoma, the state legislature um, at some point oh, about 15, 18 years ago, tried to pass legislation preventing the amount of land a tribal nation could purchase and put back into trust. And so it was like, okay, we want you to be assimilated and we want you to be these kind of farmer, rancher, entrepreneurs. And once we were doing it successfully and buying land back, then they said, oh wait, let's put another rule, or try to put another rule to prevent how much land a tribal nation can buy back. Uh, they didn't succeed at that, but the animosity still exists because of it. Sure. Thanks for that. I just want to read a couple of the comments we've got. Um, so um, I'm going to address Sana's question. So Sana asks, um, can the panelists speak a little bit more about post-coloniality uh, or post-colonial nations using colonial models themselves? West Pakistan and East Pakistan, settler uh, Kashmir's. Um, I'll talk about that in just a second. What do you think the most common, Ram Murthy G asks, what do you think the most common characteristic feature of the process of colonization around India, South Africa? across India, South Africa, and North America was. I'm gonna talk about that too in a second. Um, Shine is asking a question that I think really gets to the heart of the matter. Um, she said, does divide and rule work? It seems to have, um, it creates distress in the society. Uh, why do people still follow divisive ideologies? Uh, Shine is also saying many people in Canada think that immigrants are getting freebies, um, they do not work. I would like clarity on that one as well. Um, there's, Fantastic. Um, sorry, there's more questions? Uh, no, there is a comment on, on Facebook. Absolutely. People are basically not lazy. The workers are exploited. Uh, also, um, uh, somebody from India, uh, can't really pronounce the name, name Shapstuklura, has said uh, that they are sending hugs to the panelists who are not from India because the tribal people in India also have suffered and their stories are not even available in the general media. So true, so true. So I just wanna um, sort of bring us towards um, the close of the session. We might go a little bit longer than the two hours we had allotted, allotted so apologies for that. Um, but just to bring us towards uh, some kind of a conclusion because otherwise we can go uh, you know, all day and all night if we have to. Um, so, to address this question, so what are the commonalities? We've given three different, so two settler, settler colonial examples. So both in South Africa and in the Americas, um, specifically North America, uh, Europeans came and Europe, and in fact, when we study the history of Europe, we understand that um, so-called industrialization, so-called modernity in Europe would not have been possible if they had not been able to export elements of their so-called excess population. This is not my terminology. This is the terminology you see in the books. Um, so in other words, they exported people here and to the Americas so that they could have a less population and they could go through a certain kind of industrial model, okay? That's what we learn about them, right? And I think we do have to, a lot of times I'm studying now um, with Professor Rossigan and others, I'm studying anthropology. A lot of times we are turning the, the lens towards the indigenous cultures and I think we do need to reflect that lens and look back at Europe and say, why did Europe decide to do these things? Which brings me to the question about what are the commonalities? Again, I think the commonality is Europeans put in place structures to um, commodify whatever they possibly could. Commodification is the ultimate logic they are trying to steal. Commodification is just another word for looting. Let's be very clear. This is about theft. And the only way you can steal something, if I walk into a room 
and I say I want to steal, I mean, we're talking about stealing things that are very valuable. So if we talk about some of the, the stories that I've read since I've been researching this, you walk into a church and you want to steal all of the gold in the church, all the ceremonial gold in the Incan temples in Peru. Um, and you, you, you go in there and you say, now the only way you can do that, you can, if you do that, you're going to be killed, right? And you should be because it's, it's a violation of their, their sovereignty, their sanctimony, their, 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 their holy places, right? So the only way you can do that is if you can peel off a group in order to help them help do that, right? So that is the dividing rule. That is why we have exacerbation of certain kinds of conflict in all of these places. Uh, so we haven't talked about the details. We talked a little bit about the Boer War, but there's also the Anglo-Zulu War. There, there's the French-Indian Wars, which preceded 1776 and so on. Like this divide and rule stuff is like everywhere, right? Um, which brings us then to the question of shine, which is how does it actually work? And I think we, um, in the modern era, I think we continue to underestimate the power of propaganda. I think we're all educated a certain way and that that really has a very strong, for those of us who are not part of the ma majority sort of mainstream community, it leads to a certain kind of self-loathing. We learn that our own cultures aren't important and how does that make us feel, right? We, it makes us more willing to accept certain kinds of domination. So I think propaganda is a piece of it, but I also think that the colonial systems traumatize us. Um, and I think that, that it traumatizes even people who are part of the mainstream. And I think that one reaction to trauma is to blame. So if you are a poor, you know, white person in Alabama, and you know, I've driven through, <laughs> driven through Alabama a few times, lots of poor white people there, but you stop and you get gas and you ask about, you know, because well, I'm, a, I'm a political activist, so I'm trying to get them to have a class consciousness and talk about, okay, how are you going to rise up against the people who are oppressing you? And they're not interested in talking about that. They're interested in, you know, because I, especially I'm talking now my own history in the US, I was not seen as a black or a white. I was sort of this, you know, non, I wasn't clearly identifiable. So they would be willing to confide in me that they hate black people and they want to kill them. <laughs> like, it's like, so, so the idea of scapegoating, <laughs> the, idea, the idea of scapegoating a community which is just as pure, as poor as yours, serves some psychological purpose, I think, in the colonial framework, which helps to perpetuate the colonial framework. I don't know if uh, anyone wants to, as I've been saying, people have been putting more comments um, and I will take a moment to look at those comments. Uh, I don't know, Rasigan or Ganeshi, who would like to, to come in on that one? Just go ahead and unmute yourself and whoever would like to go. Um, but you know, in South Africa, this is particularly acute because even amongst the white community, you have high levels of inequality. And there's, there, there was a way in which a type of, and this speaks to some of the questions that have been raised on the sidebar as well, uh, Samia. Some of the early unity in South Africa would have been leftist responses. In other words, those inspired by socialist aspirations, bringing the white working class and the African black workers together in struggles against the state. And so the imposition of the hard form of separate development, and that's the resonance with those territories you were driving through as well, Samir, uh, you know, was on the basis that no, there is no need for such working class unity. Rather what you should have is you an aristocracy chosen from amongst the workers and you play the role of being the supervisor of the next tier of labor. And that largely then was able to re It's only capital that's gained. And we must be very clear about that. It's the individual holder. It's not a white person that's holding this wealth. The wealth holding them in many instances and giving them a complexion that we call white. You know, I would, um, we're very interesting times right now. And, um, you know, we're 46 days from an election, right? And, um, but the, the, the tension that exists around white supremacy in this country is, it, it, it's, 
it's hot, like it's heated, it's palpable right now in, in a way that, has, that hasn't been since probably the 40s and 50s. Um, and so it, it makes me think, you know, I, this discussion right now and this question is making me think about, you know, the states in this country right now and the states who um, would be viewed as progressive or, or, um, or more liberal states, um, you know, come have a history of a different rule of colonization than say the Southern states and some of the Plain states. Um, and so it makes me very curious to, to try to think and unpack that history around original rule of those states and then what then later became the United States and the sort of framing and reference and the, the reference that you're bringing around sort of aristocrats or, you know, I'm like, wow, you know, it makes me think about how much of the southern states, the states that Samir has drove through, um, Alabama, like those poor white working class people um, don't see themselves as being taken advantage of by the existing structure and system that they're living in, right? They feel like they're the, they're going to benefit from the current administration from the current president that he's their champion he's their ally and the like mega rich man whose interest is in exploiting workers whose history is about exploiting workers <laughs> and so it's a very interesting um you know thing to think about that makes me like oh wow if i had the time in the next 46 days to like break down like this sort of cultural reference and history um you know, it might help us, but right now what we're dealing with, the idea that poor white families feel like what they have not, what they don't have access to is because of someone else, the other, whether that's black, indigenous, grant, it's the other that is taking from them and they don't see themselves as being taken advantage by the system and the corporations who are not paying them well, who are not, who are, um, you know, grabbing up their land in eminent domain so that they can build pipelines through their farmland. Like they're not seeing that as them being exploited by the, by this like neoliberal system. What they see is that, oh, cause white, we're still having a benefit from this system. Fantastic. Thanks so much. This is um, a really fascinating discussion and we do have to sort of bring it to an end, but I also would like to share this screen. Uh, yeah. Um, so just um, a moment to thank everyone for participating um, and to say that we have lots of conversations like this. We have an earlier interview with, uh, with Rasigan Beneshi. We hope to do a one-on-one -on -one with you sometime soon, maybe after the election and you seem very busy right now. Um, are, are things really busy with the election coming up? I think they might be. Um, yeah. Um, so, but we'll, we'll definitely have an interview with, with you and we'll put it on online. Um, there is a Hindi webinar coming up. That'll be the next one on September 26th. Um, there's also going to be uh, one done by my colleague Shini on Gandhi in South Africa. We've done the English version of that already. This will be on a, a, in Hindi. Um, and also more discussions on colonialism on the 3rd of October. I'd invite everyone to subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's the I there that you can find when you search Peace Vigil on, um, on YouTube. Please share the video. Please join our Facebook group. Um, the Facebook group is called Good Things Happen Too because the organization is all uh, about hope. Uh, we don't want to leave anybody thinking there's no hope and everything is doomed and you know, let's just go home and watch TV. Uh, we do want people to understand that there are people like Beneshi, people like Rasigan Maharaj, people like Samir, and thousands of others who are working every single day to make a difference, whether it is through their classrooms, through grassroots work, through street theater, through uh, writing, um, and you know, direct action. All this is happening right now, and you can participate, it, participate in it in, in the manner possible for you. And a little bit of discomfort and inconvenience is going to happen if you're going to try and change the world. So do expect that. 
Uh, the other thing is that you will see at the bottom, there are two pictures. One is a picture of an older man, and then there's a young child sitting at the bottom. That young child was the youngest prisoner of British India. His name was Jagmohan Singh. Um, and his uncle was hanged by the British, whose picture is on the right, called Bhagat Singh. He is one of the greatest uh, stars of the Indian freedom movement against British colonialism. And since we are talking colonialism, uh, you know, I just want to mention that this is our next webinar. Professor Jagmohan Singh Ji is actually present in this webinar. He has done a lot of English uh, presentations for us. This will be in Hindi which is on the 26th, two days before Bhagat Singh's birthday. He was killed at age 23 by the British colonial government. We will be looking at Gandhi in South Africa on October 2, which is the birthday of Gandhi. It, again, it will be in Hindi. Colonialism, which is called Upniveshwad in Hindi. It is on October 3 with Jagmohan Singh Ji. Once again, we ask you to subscribe to our YouTube channel um, and also please join our Facebook page called Good Things Happen To. You can also like us on Facebook. Fantastic. Vinishi, I think we'd like you to read your, your last comment as the, the last word, if you could. Despite colonization, we're still here. We still have our culture, we still have our songs, we still speak our language. Despite every effort they have made to erase us, we're still here. So it's been an honor on this panel with you all. Thanks so Thanks much. So That's much, a everyone. beautiful uh, uh, you know, ending. And uh, thank you from Peace Vigil, Vineshi and Rasagan. And we hope to learn from you more in the future. We all have benefited uh, immensely from your uh, presentations and Samir, uh, thank you, although you are our uh, in-house expert, but you know, thank you. <laughs> and also your slides, uh, Samir, were very much appreciated. Many people have said they enjoyed it very much, the visuals that you presented. They were exciting and informative. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And uh, we'll, we'll definitely continue the conversation, and we'll be letting you know uh, when this conversation will continue. Thanks again to our panelists. We'll see you next time.